Hey everyone, my name is Lydia Schultz Cahill. I am one of the senior creative directors here at CSAC. I work in the Nashville office. And as part of our Wise Women Wednesday series, today we will be talking to Alex Klein and Allison Belts Cruz. Welcome, ladies. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so us. you're so welcome. Um, I think that I need to do a disclaimer for everyone. These ladies. They are phenomenal songwriters, but they're also hilarious. And I feel like there's a little bit of a lag time on Zoom. So if it ever seems slow, it's because I'm waiting for jokes to land because I just want the, mm -hmm. I want the crowd to get, you know, their, their money's worth here. Yeah. Um, you find yourself not laughing. It's because of Zoom. It's not because we're <laughs> funny. It's because I've, I've said that for about a year now. <laughs> Um, but so the part of this panel, this series that we're doing is we want to amplify and, you know, promote female voices, especially in country music. And I thought who better to give a microphone than you two knuckleheads. Yeah, well, that was a laugh pause. Um, <laughs> I was like, should I say? You're, you were right. This was the perfect <laughs> duo to have on here. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. Um, so we want to talk about the idea of, we hear all the time that Nashville is a 10-year town and not to discredit any other years of your life, but let's kind of try to focus on the 10 years that you've been in Nashville, because if memory serves me right, you're both about either on or around that 10-year mark. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I also want to hear about like first songs you wrote, and I'm sure that was longer than 10 years ago, but let's start and stay on track and focus with 10 years at first. Okay. So Alex, if you could, let's start with you. Yes. Oh God. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I had been writing songs, getting off, let's just start off track, been writing songs since I was in high school, but yeah, being it coming into Nashville is kind of when the real education of songwriting happened because I feel like you can write songs in you know in Boston where I was going to school and taking classes about songwriting but then when I moved down to Nashville I realized oh all of these songs are crap because I'm surrounded by incredible songwriters and the bar just got raised like 10 rungs so um I mean I started off just like writing songs by myself a lot of my inspirations were a little bit more Americana left of center less you know music row co-writing stuff but I knew that I wanted to get into writing commercial country music. And so, um, so I was in a band uh, about nine years ago called the Luna Bells and we were on Sony. And that's kind of when I started really uh, writing songs was when I was in that group and meeting really great songwriters and, uh, and huge apologies to the few people that come to mind who I won't name, but who had to be in a room with me when I was first learning how to co-write because that was probably painful, but um, I mean, yeah, the first songs were probably like not amazing, but they kept getting better and better. And I found my voice as a songwriter. And, you know, I think every few years you look back and be like, wow, I'm an even better songwriter than I was, you know, before. And you're always growing and learning from your co-writers and like Allison, who always pushes me to be better. So <laughs> anyways, does that answer your question? Is that 10 full years? <laughs> That was pretty years. fast. That was pretty fast. Oh, okay. Oh, so some of my first songs. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, so do you want to know like some of the amazing successes that I've had or whatever with some of the songs? Is that what you're? That is, is that what I question? would love to know. The last okay. 10 years. So, so the, highs, so the, highs, lows. Highs, lows. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. So um, I, my first major cut was with um, Ronnie Dunn and it was a single called Damn Drunk. And that was a like a, you know, crying moment when I got to hear him sing on a song that I had written. And, um, and you know, from then on, Reba, McIntyre, um, I produced some stuff for Aaron Enderlin, who was my first like production job. And we had some, we wrote that Reba song together and I had some cuts on her record that I produced. Um, Tara Thompson, who was on Big Machine, I had her first single and a bunch of Canadian stuff. Just Moskaloop was like one of my first cuts up in Canada before all the stuff down here. And 
um, you know, since then, uh, you know, Allison and I have written some stuff for our good friend, Tenille Arts, who I think I saw show up in the chat. So she's, she's watching. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, best, best moment in the career, I'll say is, is a moment that we're sharing together, which is our current top 10 single with Tenille, somebody like that, which I got to produce as well. And um, I'm trying to think, yeah, I mean, some other stuff in there, but those are some of the highlights. So, and there's a lot of low lights too, like thinking that you're going to get a bunch of cuts with certain people and then they end up not, you know, happening or you get a cut. I've had plenty of cuts with some big name artists that have just, you know, it's going to be the next single and then it never even sees the light of day. And it's kind of, you just have to say to yourself, you know what, if you're lucky enough to be in town for long enough, we all have those stories and it's just kind of like a rite of passage to have your, to get your hopes up and have them let down from time to time. So. Oh, it's quite the up. Yeah. Highs yeah. are very high. Lows are very low. And yeah. for those of you listening, mm -hmm. Allison and Alex are the songwriters and Alex is the producer mm -hmm. on the Tennille art song that is at number 10 right oh, now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, but it's very exciting because it is an all female everything on this song. So it is very appropriate for this conversation. Yes. Allison, what about you? Um, I, am I muted? Okay, no, I'm not muted. Um, <laughs> Good. I feel like when I, when I, I moved here from New York City in 2011 and a producer had found me um, and he moved me here to do a record. So I did the artist thing when I first moved here and I did that for like five years or six years. I think that's maybe a typical thing that happens. I mean, even Alex like was in a band and that's kind of what happens when you first move to town. Not everybody, but um, I feel like my time here, I mean, I was like a waitress in New York City and I moved here with like $40. So really whatever the deal was gonna be, I was gonna sign it. And, but it happened to be just in an arena of uh, the caliber of writers was, I didn't have any idea at the time how how much I did not belong in those rooms yet. I was in rooms with insanely amazing, successful writers. Um, and I just feel like my, my road here in town when I first moved here kind of went like straight to the top. And then like, I, I was signed to a record label and they picked the single and we did the record and all of those things and it was happening. And then, and then the single didn't work and, and I, was dropped from my publishing company and dropped from my label. And so it went all the way up and then all the way down. And then it's been like a tick, 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 tick. That's kind of been my process here in Nashville. And I'm really grateful for this, this slow, this phase of it, because um, I really think I learned so much more even there because I, I was too green to understand even how to listen when I was first in rooms with those amazing writers. I just, I was, it was such a whirlwind and I was just so happy to get, a, uh, have a paycheck that I was like, <laughs> I wasn't really focused on learning. Um, that's great, I'm gonna go. I actually can't decline it because it's connected. Oh, go on mute. <laughs> this is a very accurate, um, so Alex and Allison have, a writing duo name. Alex, if you would like to yeah, let all of the uh, panelists know about that beauty. Yeah, we call ourselves Alkaline. So <laughs> it's a combination oh. of uh, Allison and Alex Klein and something. Get like it? That. <laughs> no, yeah, get it. <laughs> I really shove it down their throats. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> oh. Anyway. Anyways. Um, anyway, somewhere around 2000, 16 I um let the I just sort of I saw the merit and the privilege of just being a writer in this town there is no other town like this music town where you can have a writing job and it can be you know your regular job and you're not plucked and you know um, taken from here and going on tour and, and leaving your family or whatever. And it's just, it's such a, I was like, I just kind of woke up and said, 
wow, what if I was just a writer? And um, I think that's when things popped off for me and clicked because that's where it was supposed to be. Um, and like six months later, I wrote um, my, my first number one in town, which is called Prayed For You. Um, Matt Stell and I and Ash Bowers wrote that song. And um, yeah, really just moving from the artist thing where everything is about you and trying to tell your story to then being in the room and trying to like help other people tell their story. It was, it was just right on time and it was right where I needed to be. And, um, but I'm, I'm so grateful that I failed as many times as I did. I'm really, I'm, I'm very grateful for all those moments because um, it just makes the experience here more rich and it makes you more patient and uh, not as panicky when things don't materialize when you, when you want them to. Yeah. Allison, will you tell a little bit of the story behind prayed for you and how all of that came to be because it's one of my favorite stories in all of Nashville. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I was not a praying person, um, up until about October of 2016. And I, um, I found faith later in my life and, um, it just kind of changed my whole world around and, um, skipped to 2017 on May 1st, I was baptized. And on May 5th, I went to sing at a wedding and I met a, a man there. And um, we, I mean, I would say we hit it off. It was just kind of, it was an odd, it was not thing. <laughs> we had like, I don't know, but it was something, it was something awesome. And he asked me out on a date and um, on May 11th, and I was looking through my journals in my, from October to that time when I was finding faith for the first time and meeting God. And um, I read them and I said, I prayed for this. This is the guy I've, I've been praying for. I know, I know this, this is the one. And that morning I had a write with Matt Stell and Ash Bowers and it kind of just fell on me as a, as a title and how a, so how a song could wrap up. Um, and I just, you know, bulldozed into that room and I was like, this is, I, I think this is really special and, and Ash and Matt were so awesome. And they just kind of, you know, we, we tailored it to Matt's life and his narrative as a country male. And, um, it's just such a God thing that that was my first, after all of the pining and um, clawing at just having something, you know, work here in town, um, that felt the most effortless and the most, um, like a little hug from, from up above. And so, um, it will always be my first number one in town. And I think that that's really anytime I can throw that glory up to, to God. Um, I will, cause it's, it's so true. I didn't do a lot for that moment. It was a lot of yeah. And now we're married. Sorry, but I married the guy. What happened with them? <laughs> yeah, anyway, we went on a couple dates and <laughs> I'm just kidding. No. He never called me back. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am pregnant right now. Um, I'm like different, different guy or no, just kidding. <laughs> three weeks away. No, same dude. Um few weeks away. He um when I when I first met him, he also had a four-year-old he had just lost his wife that's just that's just part of our story and so I, I stepped into her world and I became her mom immediately and so I've been her mom for four years and now I'm going to be uh, a first-time mom here and <laughs> <laughs> and yeah it's just like and it all happened in this town and it all happened and music has been such a part of the story and Thank you, Lydia, for always wanting to shine light on that story because um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's great. Um, it really is. Oh, I just love it. And it truly, I remember you coming in, like meeting you early, like 2016, and then meeting with you later in 2016. And just everything about you is different. Like, oh, okay. Um, I remember that yeah. day too. You're like, what have you been doing? <laughs> I read the Bible. I was like, the Bible. What? So it's not just 60 or however many ounces of water you're supposed to drink a day. Yeah. Honestly, I don't know. It's more than water. 
<laughs> more than water. Um, <laughs> thank you both for sharing those. Do you have any advice that you all, there's also, we don't have, this is for everyone tuning in. We have the little chat box and everyone is saying very cute and sweet things. But if you have any questions, things that you want to know about from two wonderful, talented females, we will try to get to those things at the end. Meant to say that at the beginning, saying it now. Mm -hmm. um, so let's start with people, male, female, whoever, who want to get more involved in songwriting, specifically in Nashville. Do you mm -hmm. all have any advice, any do's, any don'ts? What would you say to someone? Mm -hmm. I think you just muted yourself. Oh, Allison's, Allison just opted out of answering that question first. I see what happened. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, wait, are you trying to speak? You just muted yourself. Uh <laughs> Go for it, Alex. Um, okay, well, okay. I love to pretend like I have great advice, but I guess what I would say is that, um, <clears throat> is to try to, is to come up with the people that you're coming into Nashville with to a degree, because I think that a lot of us get into town and we think that, uh, you know, we're hot ass or whatever. I don't know if I'm allowed to cuss on this, but, um, and we're like, you know, oh yeah, I heard it's a 10 year town, but it's going to be a six month town for me. And I deserve to be in the room with, you know, X big writer and so-and-so. And, -so. and um, you don't, when you first move into town, like you, like, I think sometimes our egos are a little inflated when we first come in before we get kind of, and before we get, you know, the much needed knock down a peg, which we've all been many times. But I mean, all of the great success stories that I've heard of writers um, having their moments have hardly ever been, I was a brand new writer and I managed to get a write with Shane McAnally and I had a number one hit. It's never that. Right. It's always like me and my friends were just writing together because no one else was writing with us. You know, this is the story of Dallas Davidson and all of these dudes where they just wrote with each other and they were writing their best material because they were friends and felt comfortable with each other and they all came up together and that's just how it is is you kind of come up in groups of friends and it's hardly really ever you trying to reach up to you know just because someone's a hit songwriter doesn't mean you're going to write a hit song with them and I think that that's that's mm -hmm. important is to just like work within your peer group and do great stuff there and that's going to end up being more fruitful than going after people that maybe you know you're not ready to write with quite, quite yet Alex that's yeah. great advice thank you <laughs> I'll, I'll consider all of that yeah. <laughs> um, in your next 10 years yeah I think, right. um I think that there I think finding the balance of making sure what you're writing is something you want you'd want to listen to mm -hmm. and um you know finding a balance of remembering why you started doing this why you loved music in the first place but at the same time there's nothing wrong with knowing and getting to know your market and um there's nothing cold about that <clears throat> I think that's often a misconception um, that it's like somehow less than purist to just, you know, listen to the radio. If, if radio is where you want to go and it's country radio, listen to country radio and um, don't moment, you know, when you're in the room, don't go against your gut to go with that, but go in with education. And, and also I'd say to um, set up your, your rooms, like you can, you can kind of um, design them yourself. If you know that a producer, you work very well with a producer and this artist would work better with this producer than maybe this artist, this artist needs a different producer. Don't be afraid to kind of like, as you, not just a publisher, but as you, as the writer to kind of design the room yourself to get the best song out of it. And um, having a trajectory for what you're writing for. I mean, for me personally, it helps the boundary of it to me yields more creativity than the, um, than just let's just write like that. To, for me, I like the boundary of knowing my market and um, knowing what the artist needs and knowing what they don't have, you know, what, what's the tone you don't have on this record yet that we can, you know, what have you not said? And um, best case scenario, it's something they really want to say from their heart and you can kind of go, oh, cool. You haven't said that. That's awesome. Let's, let's write that. That's great. But um, strategy is not 
anti uh, creativity, I guess. I mm -hmm. one thing I would say. Well, and I think you have to be more strategic now than ever because there are so many songwriters. And if you don't have a plan when you go into the room, like they can get a right tomorrow with a whole bunch of people who do have a strategy. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of strategies and having a plan, let's talk a little bit about the success that you all are having with Tenille. We talked a little about how having that core group of writers and people that you come up with, is that something that you all are now thinking like, oh, here it is. It's now happening with this lovely young lady. Hmm. You go um, first, Allison. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, that's something that from day, you can't, you just can't predict um, what room is going to feel the most productive and the most uh, chalk lined and the most fun and the most creative and the most easy, you, like there are, and that's that's the room with me and Alex and Tamil every single time, you know, and every single time, and I really do mean that. Like it's at the absolute very least, it's hilarious and a blast. And we've also gotten great material out of it. And I feel like we, um, I feel like Tamil, I feel like we all have a voice in that room and um, ultimately it's Tenille's voice that and her story that wants to come through. But she's just, I mean, you, she's a gem and the, and, and the chemistry is also a gem, but I mean, Tenille is just, uh, she's just a gem. And I like you, you write with a bunch of new artists and you never know what's going to be the thing. Um, so it's kind of like, everything feels like an anomaly at one point, you know, um yeah. yeah i mean i'll yeah i'll second all that i don't know what to add except for teniel is a gem we're not just saying that because she's in the chat somewhere right now but we're not no. saying that because we want more rights yeah right <laughs> <laughs> no i think and like i said like i was saying even before just knowing what you knowing what the tone on the of the record that's missing and what you want to throw on it she's very she um she can blend a heartfelt this is actually what i want to say and this is a part of my life that i want to say but this also is a it's a hole in the record so let's let's fill it and so it's like that balance is there too and so we can get you know good work done and not every artist is like that so yeah yeah that's some advice that i'll give to any up-and-coming artists that are listening is that um don't like whenever uh, I'm sure a lot of artists don't want to hear, what are you looking for? But it is super helpful if you have an answer to that, because just saying, I just want to write the best song possible is almost like Allison was saying, that's almost too broad of like, I, like I would like some sort of box thing of like, man, really, you know, really wanting an up-tempo up -tempo summer song or whatever. I think that that can only help everyone as opposed to being kind of, I think a lot of artists want to be modest and just be like, I just want to write, you know, like, I don't want to steer it too much in one direction, whatever, whatever the room's feeling like, you know, right. Like that, coming in, everyone kind of coming in with a direction can be really helpful. And everyone right. works differently too. For sure. I think, you know, in one room saying, Hey, let's just write a great song. Who cares mm -hmm. where it lands? That's going to mm -hmm. ignite somebody else, somebody's mm -hmm. creativity. Like that's going to set them on fire. And I feel like, so every, every single room with every single dynamic is completely different. It's like a totally different soup. Every mm -hmm. time, every time you write, you know, yes. Like ingredients, <laughs> like chicken noodle, like a chicken noodle. You can be the noodle. <laughs> <laughs> You can be my noodle, babe. I'll oh be gosh. your chicken. <laughs> okay. Um, beautiful, beautiful. The you two are no fun at all. The I think it's interesting. The I remember our sweet friend Rob Hatch one time saying, you know, songwriters, you need to think so much about what it is that you're saying in this song because if it works hopefully, fingers crossed, in theory, this artist is going to sing these words yep. for until they can no longer. So being yeah. very intentional 
It's a great point. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great point for sure. Yeah. It yeah. makes me happy that some songs have not gotten cut and live yeah. on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the study that USC did that just came out, the Annenberg Inclusion Study. So they looked at the Hot 100 year-end chart, I think for nine years or so, but Alex, you're a producer <laughs> and a female. So the 12.9% of, oh no, wrong stat, hold on, give me a second. <laughs> so the ratio that they, numbers, 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 the ratio that they came up with was that for every 38 male producers, there's one female. Mm -hmm. So being a female producer and also being in country music, would you say that that ratio is close? What are your thoughts? What's your experience yeah. been? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say that sounds accurate. And I would almost say that I would guess that a lot of the stats that they have about female producers are um, including female artists that co-produce their own stuff. Mm -hmm. So probably mm -hmm. like, like Carrie Underwood co-produces her stuff, mm -hmm. um, you know, so um, which is a little bit like uh which would be I would just say maybe a little different than women just going out there and trying to produce other records so but yeah that sounds about right I mean I've don't I don't see a lot I mean there are more women which I'm grateful for that I feel like I'm seeing starting to show up in this role which is really encouraging but when I started producing I definitely didn't see any women that I could look up to and say oh wow I want to be like that I see that and I know that I can be that because so and so has done it and that's you know something to go after so I, I would say that it's about right it's a it seems like for some reason or another and I don't understand why it's kind of become or it has been for a long time a, a man's role in Nashville at least so Will you tell your story about the, the console? <laughs> I just think it's so important to be. So now everyone will know that I'm a honest. Well, it's basically. <laughs> you don't have to tell it if you don't want, but no, now, no, no, no. They... Now, now everyone's going to wonder, Lydia. So I got to tell. <laughs> no. Yeah. I, uh, I was just, we were chatting <laughs> yesterday and I was just saying, well, I'll say so you know, even from like when I started college and I took one engineering class, I'll say, and I'll go out and uh, admit that originally I had no desire to be a producer when I was going to college. I just thought sitting in a windowless room, listening to the same song over and over and over and over <laughs> again into the wee hours of the morning sounded like my worst nightmare. So I'm kind of uh, surprised. I think my, my college self would be surprised that this is the role that I ended up being in and loving. Mm -hmm. um, but um, when I was going to say when I was going to college, it was very important to know all of this studio gear and engineering. And now, you know, even years later, or not that many years later, so much of production is like, you know, a laptop and some gear in your studio, one microphone, like I have, you know, admittedly, I'll say, like, I, I know what gear that I have that I like, and I don't know that much about other gear that I don't have because I have yeah. one microphone that I love that I, you know, spent a good amount of money on and one chain of a compressor and an EQ and, um, you know, recording software and that's it. And it sounds good. And I don't feel the need to, you know, overwhelm myself with, I, I feel the need to buy a lot of instruments and other things like that, but not necessarily to, you know, mess around with all that other stuff. And a lot of the records that are being done are mainly in bedroom studios or basement studios in your house. And that's how I do a lot of my stuff. And maybe a couple of times a year, I'll go into the studio and get to have a full band, have the big console and all that stuff. So that being said, I had a friend um, named Lizzie McAvoy, who's obviously way more uh, knowledgeable about gear than I am after this story is told. Um, and she has a, an amazing console like in her basement studio that some company gave to her because she's a badass. And the trade-off was you get this console, but we need like X amount of content videos to show you using it and friends using it. So she invited me over and to like record a song and video it. And at the, <laughs> and at the end, she was like, 
So, okay, so I'm just gonna video you using the console and, you know, mixing it and telling me what you're doing. And I literally looked at it and I was like, cause whenever I'm in the studio using a console, I have an engineer and an assistant engineer there who is yeah. who works at that studio and their whole job, their whole life is knowing that console. And I was just like pushing some faders <laughs> up, tweaking some knobs. Oh, wow, listen to that. Wow, that sounds, doesn't that sound great? Wow. <laughs> Zero clue what I was doing, mortified that someone was going to find out that I was a complete hack and a fraud. And <laughs> no, I'll just tell them. It's, yeah, it's, it's out there on the internet somewhere. It's called Alex Klein pretending to be a producer, but. <laughs> I just think it's so important to talk about things like that because especially in a role that is dominated by men, it can be extremely intimidating and right. you don't need to know what every single button does. Like, forgive yeah. my ignorance with that, but there are ways to do what you do without owning a thousand microphones, owning every single piece of gear. If you want to produce, you can just produce. I mean, anyone not to be like too timely, but I just watched the Billie Eilish documentary. Mm -hmm. I'm very hip into Billie. And, so uh, hip. <laughs> and if you, I mean, and I was suspicious that this was how her record was made, but it, what her whole record was made with her brother <laughs> recording it without any treatment in a room, off some microphone that looked probably inexpensive, not even like a vocal shield or anything, on a laptop in Logic, and you zoom in on Logic here and there, and there are like two things going on in the track. And that album won like seven Grammys. And yeah. so it's like nothing in there probably, and none of the instruments were like out of control. They didn't go into some crazy studio. They just sat in that bedroom. I mean, it's just like, it's just all about you know, you don't need all of that stuff. There are no, there are no barriers to entry really. You just need some creativity and, you know, and a recording program. So. Yeah. There is this pressure that you need all. I remember even going to Belmont and the MacBook that I bought, they're like, well, this one has a fast processor in case you want to be a producer. And I bought it. <laughs> I didn't need that. I've never I'll actually take that because I do need a fast processor. So if you still have that computer. <laughs> so the 12.9% number that I just threw out there that had no context whatsoever found it. Yeah. So 12.9% was the amount of female songwriters on oh. the year end chart. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about mental health because I love mental health. You all have discussed with me. I don't know if people can tell, but we're all very friendly. And I get to hear messages from the two of you very often, but talk to me about the process with your song going up the chart, the pressure that you then put on yourself, the pressure that you feel like the rest of the town puts on you mm -hmm. kind of go through your thought process. Your feel. That, was that all genres? Just curious. Or was it's that the hot, the year end hot 100. So oh, yeah. that's everything. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's tough because, okay. So you just hear no more than yes. I mean, the ratio of no to yes is, is insane. So you have to get so and then there are the no's that you expect because you didn't really believe in that song. And then you write a song that you actually really think is like your thing, your moment. And that no is like, how am I even doing this? Then how, wh where am I, you know? And, and so it can yeah. kind of, you just hear so many no's. Every single day is filled with, I mean, even if you're on top of the world in this industry, you're still hearing um, um, amidst the yeses. Mm -hmm some of them, whatever, you're hearing so many no's. So um, I think the, the call to have a very strong constitution and identity outside of what you can do for the music industry is very, that if, if that's a piece of advice, then, then finding that, because this, I mean, it can, you can feel like a pinball in one of those pinball machines <laughs> and it's tough. I mean, it, yeah. And it's, it's tough too, when you, like we were talking about yesterday, when you, um, the stakes get higher, when you have stuff that's more seen and heard by people, and then it's like, can you, can you do it again? And can you, yeah, well that happened, but isn't it just like we were talking about yesterday, like it's like Everest, every single 
base camp, just simply you get there and it's awesome and you celebrate for two seconds and then it just reveals the next base camp that you're not at yet. Um, and that can be, you know, sometimes I just, sometimes I feel like I can just so take it. Alex, I'm sure you, mm-hmm. you feel this way too, because I've been doing it for so long. And then sometimes it just, it's, it's, it, it's hard. It's hard mm-hmm. to hear. It's hard to hear. No. How do yeah. you feel, Alex? Yeah, I'll say the same thing. I mean, um, Allison and I, I'll just like disclose, like text each other just about every morning about that what you're talking about is the songs rising about our chart position and <laughs> the spins and the gains and who we passed and, ha- and stalling out and all that stuff. So it's definitely like, which we kind of, I think, try to turn into just more like a fun game of being like, ooh, look at this thing, kind of, you know. But um, But yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, you tell yourself, you know, honestly, I'll say, I'll backtrack and say with the single, um, I have been so used to being in this town for over 10 years, having um, everything that I do have minimal impact. And so when we, when we got told you have Danielle's next single and you're producing and whatever, I was very excited, but I was like, cool, I'm sure it will have minimal impacts like everything else. I mean, it's an indie label. It's a female artist. She's new. I'm unknown as a producer. And, um, you know, and so when the first day came out and it was the number one most added at country radio, it was like, oh, this is a pleasant surprise. And then you start telling yourself, well, I'll be happy if we just get to x place if we get to the top 50 or we get to the top 40 or the top 30 or whatever and i think that like allison said it's always like but now i need to get to now i you know we're at top 10 now i need to get to the top five and then it will be one and then after that it will be well what's the next thing i mean honestly i find myself all the time trying to bring myself back into the moment of this amazing thing that i've waited a decade for and i can't help but think what's the next thing after this and will i feel satisfied like I can breathe if I just know I have another single coming um coming up or if I get x y or z in the industry but you have to know that there's never not going to be that feeling it's always going to be well then I need to know that it's you know I have a third single or that I have an ACM Mm -hmm. nom or a Grammy nom or whatever or I'm producing you know this or that and something uh interesting that I was just talking about, uh, which I'll say, um, I have a therapist and I think that it's very important in this town sometimes to have a therapist and, you know, just, you know, I think that it's become like less stigmatized to say, say there, you know, therapy out loud, but we were having this conversation where I was like, you know, I really expected at this moment to just wake up every day and just be elated just every day. Oh my God, I can't believe that I am having this moment that I've been waiting a decade for. And I don't feel that way. And I'm incredibly grateful. Like that's not to say that I'm not grateful. I think that just a lot of us get into this industry as opposed to getting into like the accounting industry where you assume I'm going to go to work from nine to five, but my happiness is going to come from my family and my relationships and things that I do outside. But I think a lot of us come to Nashville and say, my happiness is going to come from this industry. And to assume that is um, is incorrect because at the end of the day, it's not. It doesn't really change anything that's going on in here. And if you can accept that, that can actually be really freeing to know that if you have a number one, or you never have a number one, you're still going to be the same here. And mm-hmm. so, just kind of identifying that and and yeah. focusing that like fulfillment comes from other places than just this marker that you think is going to bring you happiness or approval from other people so I hope that your therapist is watching because she'd be very (laughs) proud of you that was such a you'd be surprised she'd probably be surprised I I am proud of you Alex this is is great (laughs) anyways if if everyone could just Venmo me a hundred dollars for that advice it would help pay for my therapy bills so yes yes Yeah, it is a very interesting that you are working and working and scratching and clawing to get to this moment, thinking that it'll get easier. And I think it actually gets more difficult because you realize just how competitive and how talented the people who are at the top really are. Oh, absolutely. 
-hmm. it's exciting to get a chance to compete, but it has to be overwhelming at the same time. Well, uh, yeah. And I'll say too, it's like, you know, when you're at a certain level of like before, let's say reaching this moment, you feel like whether it's true or not, you're only competing with your peers that you're seeing. But then when mm -hmm. you get to another level, then the anxiety of I'm competing with Shane McAnally right now or whatever, or those people can be, if you let that get in your head, it can be pretty stressful, you know? Yeah. Well, and I always, I don't remember who said this, but someone said like, well, everyone's guessing. So why not you? Mm -hmm. And people are a little more strategic. Like we're not just throwing noodles at the wall to see if they're ready to eat, but a lot of people really are just guessing. So I feel like, especially as a female, when mm -hmm. you're looking around and you're seeing a lot of these male faces, like mm -hmm. they might just be guessing too. Like throw your idea in the hat. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Dun, 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 dun. Okay. We have about 15 minutes left and I want to save time for questions if people have questions, but is there anything else, any little stories, anything that either of you would like to share about your experiences in country music as the wonderful females you are? Well, you're wonderful. And I, I'm very happy to have switched over to CSAC and and work with you. with you and um yeah I think I mean I don't know I think um this it's just it's an honor to be able to keep working and doing this for a living mm. especially after last year where every split second was so there was so much uncertainty and um knowing that we even though we took such a hit as an industry you know and in, in certain ways in a lot of ways um being able to do this with this community of people and having everybody leveled to the same place was a really um cool thing at the end of the day it was a cool thing to and i think it will make us all closer as a community even though we're you know it's competitive but yeah. there's community within that competition and i don't know how that's possible but it's in nashville it really is something that um has been able to happen here like I'm, I mean even you know my friendship with with Alex like it's just you know we'll we'll always be friends and like that's something that you know we did not meet socially we met in a writer room like this is yeah. a working yeah we met working together and we were saying yesterday and I we were we talked for like an hour yesterday and you know it's people over people over songs you know that's what it's just, it's people, people are the whole point, the who you're even you writing with an artist to get that song, to get it to radio. It's for the, it's for the people in the car listening to the radio. It's like, it, it it's really about people, all of it. And so I'm just, I'm just grateful. And I think clinging to the gratitude of what is in front of you is the, and what you do have um, is, you know, a great way to a great place to dwell yeah yeah I'll, I'll second all of that for sure so yeah <laughs> and and we love you and we love i think shannon hatch was here earlier i was gonna say i came for shannon hatch and i stayed for lydia schultz so <laughs> <laughs> oh that's what a beautiful tagline <laughs> <laughs> you can you, you can use that for oh your... <laughs> we're gonna make t-shirts <laughs> do it i love that that's like the best compliment i've gotten in a very long time I say things like, this is the best thing that ever happened to me, happened to me. And then I remember that I got married in July. So I'm like, <laughs> Sorry. I guess that was cool too. So that was fine. Yeah. Um, oh, my husband just said, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> oh, <whoops>. um, here. <laughs> oopsies. The, uh, so one of you, what was it? What was it? I don't want to forget the songs on the charts. Maybe I forgot. I think I forgot. We have to move on. Oh, um, no. If you remember, just interrupt whatever sentence we're in the middle of and bring it up. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, do you all think, oh, I remember. <laughs> what does it feel like having a song? And I don't want to say that no one has heard the song, Allison, you and I have talked about this a little bit, 
but there's a difference between hearing a song on the radio and getting to go see the song out live. Mm. So, yeah. and you, in my mind, you hear those songs two different ways. So like you, there's my experience in the car, there's my experience on Spotify, mm -hmm. but then there's my experience at a concert. Are you all excited to see? Cause I believe both of you have a couple of songs on this project, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Just to yeah. see how these things translate. I remember being in Wisconsin, visiting my sister and I was like, how do I know this song? Like, what, what is this? And then I realized that it was y'all's yeah. and I was like, oh, oh yeah. Because the world is still moving and songs yeah, are still right. reaching yeah. places outside yeah. of my little Nashville bubble. So are you all yeah. on I a scale? That. I want that so bad for Tennille too, yeah. to be able to go and be, she has a top 10 record and to be able to go and play shows and see people knowing these lyrics. Like, I want to go to that show. I want to be at yes. that show. And I really want it for Tennille because um, this has got to be so, like writers have been able to write. Like we can, yeah. we can get our, you know, the yayas out, you know, for lack of a better term, we've been, a we've been able to do that for all of last year and this year. Um, artists have just missed that, that um, something that is just, I know that's because I used to be one, just it's in them to, you know, it's such a part of everything. So I cannot wait until Tennille is able to go out there and interact with the crowd. And yes, I want to go to that show and see, yeah. we haven't, I mean, we, she had an album release in January of 2020 and we saw the whole album and it was so fun. Alex and I went and we spent way too much at Fifth and Taylor after. Yes, <laughs> we oh, what a good dinner. time. Back when I went to restaurants, oh, oh my God, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it was like so a thing. So I, I cannot wait yeah. to see that. But I mean, I, I guess to answer you, I haven't seen that because there haven't been any shows, but here's yeah. hoping for summer of 2021. Yeah, like, I mean, I'll... I'll say really quick that like um, that uh, it's kind of it's crazy to have this song, especially I mean, Allison's had a number one before, but to have this is the song that's done the most in my career that I've written. And it almost kind of feels like it's happening hypothetically or not real, you know, like in a bubble, because it's really the only way that I know is because I look at the charts like all the time and it's like oh cool now it's here but you know um you don't I don't get to like follow up that feeling and remind myself by seeing it live seeing the reaction to people yeah. even like you know mm -hmm. I've been spending some time with my family in California there were no country radio stations here so it's just like I haven't heard it on the radio hardly I haven't seen it performed except for you know over a year ago um at the at the back corner and so all the things that kind of go with that that kind of reinforce ah oh, this is really happening mm -hmm. haven't been able to happen yet so it'll be I think a really amazing feeling like you know, be really this summer when we can be like oh yeah we did we did that thing and these people are singing along to it and that's really awesome however so. I mean arena shows and festival mm -hmm. shows and regular shows and whatever aside I did hear it in Michael's today oh yeah that was <laughs> that was a full that was like the comp that was the colliding uh, of the two worlds <laughs> right there I don't know perhaps the music <laughs> it, it was sense. okay here, here's the joke it was to kneel arts and crafts oh my gosh <laughs> Wait, do Beautiful. I see a partnership between Michael? Alex, no. <laughs> yeah, Zach says no. Alex, no. <laughs> you, not to, I mean, I'm still bragging on Tennille, but this girl bedazzles, like, oh. her guitar. like, you need to look this up. Like, she bedazzles her whole guitar. Like, as I was walking through Michael's, I was like, this is actually this girl's total store because she put, like, like rows of the crystal things on a guitar and there's like a TikTok video of it and and she like tells people how to do it so to Neil arts and crafts i don't yeah. think this is far <laughs> from, from like wait a minute this is genius <laughs> Austin, how That's often do you go to <laughs> michael's i feel like i've been on the phone with you and you're like oh i'm just in michael's <laughs> so true the last time we talked it was in michael's well i mean i have a eight-year-old and she we're moving and she is uh experiencing her last day of her school on this friday 
And I, so I moved every single year. My parents just plucked me out of this school, threw me into the other. And I, it was such a whiplash thing. And I feel like with any parent, you just don't want to do, you know, the crap that hurt you to your kids. And so I am making this entire thing for her to commemorate her time in the school that she is before she moves to her new school. So that is why I was at my Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. So thank you. And, and then I heard the song and I was in an aisle by myself and I audibly said, I wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> to <your> no one. <laughs> and, Did anyone say wow? Or I was so excited. No, no one heard me. No one was there. <laughs> can, I, can I tell a really quick story that will just like bring you back down to earth? I had a similar, it's kind of similar ish experience. So really quick, anybody who's CSAC might know that there's a CSAC writer named Aaron Anderson is a good friend and we wrote this mm -hmm. song called waffle house christmas with bill anderson and he played it on the opry a handful of times and he put it on his most recent record if you don't know bill he's written like hits in every decade for the last literally mm -hmm. 50 years and um and it's this it's a silly song and but he ended up being incredibly smart with marketing and he got waffle house behind it and it went into the waffle house jukebox and all of this merch and all this stuff so Aaron and I, right when it went to the Waffle House jukebox on a Sunday, we're like, we have to go to Waffle House and we have to hear this song and just celebrate. And so we invited all these people to come, which of course, like almost nobody showed up, which just, what? <laughs> we should have called you. Everyone, it was like Sunday. I will go to Waffle House. People, yeah. I, so it was I'm Sunday. Right I would, I'll go to Waffle House <laughs> today right now. <laughs> and so we show up to Waffle House and it's Sunday and I'm usually used to going to Waffle House. Not that many people are there. So like the waitress comes up and she's like, you know, hey, honey's like how many people you got? And we're waiting for people to show up and we're like, oh, well. I don't know how many people are going to be here. She's like, well, I got to know how many for your table. And we're like, oh, well, you see, uh, we're, we're celebrating because uh, we got a song in the Waffle House jukebox. <laughs> and she just looked at us like, how many people you got coming? Like, it was like, good. <laughs> cool. Who's coming? Well, cool. anyways, like, what size is your table? And that just brought us back down to earth so quickly. So anyways, you might think you're hot shit until... <laughs> I think I you could probably have a pretty strong, pretty moment with that Waffle House or a pretty woman yeah. moment with that Waffle yeah, House absolutely. and go back and like buy it with all your royalties. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. My Waffle House now. It's my jukebox. Okay. Huge. Um, um, Alex, yeah, it looks like question? we have a question. Uh, da -dun -dun -dun. I've never done this before. All right, Alex, what can female producers do in the face of stigma and bias to become more equitable, equitably represented in the industry? Oh, man, uh, that's a great question. <laughs> I'll kind of I'll kind of dance around it and just say, I mean, um, just knowing that you're just getting out there and doing your thing and you will get recognized I will say just being great at what you do and not worrying about you know if the fact that you're not a man and uh and I'll say you know with all of the negatives um that you know maybe we experience sometimes as being women I will say that in this industry or in that role as a producer I have found that it's if you can take it and use it as a positive for sure because I say to myself all the time if I was a man producing I would just be one of many men producing yeah, right yeah. now and it would not be that special it would just be like oh there's another dude producing but I think that you can use it if you're smart as a way to stand out from the pack and maybe be a little bit more original so it's just kind of all, all how you you know want to look at it yeah mm -hmm. Um, Allison, do you want to piggyback off of that thought? I feel like piggyback is something people always say on Zoom. <laughs> We're just a bunch of piggybackers. I thought that was, I thought that was circle back. <laughs> oh, no, I think actually, like we're going to come back later, later, like in the next Zoom. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wait, um, I thought it was a production question. What's the question? <laughs> the question was about equality and re female representation as a producer like are there things that you can do to rise above like stay positive do you have any thoughts yeah. on 
Um, How do you stay so positive, Allison? Oh, um, well, I mean, just the, the sheer survival of it all, it does not, I mean, you know, and that's not everyone's situation, just moving here and having like hawking a guitar for my first month's rent. And there really was no time to think about which gender I was or mm. what, you know, there wasn't any time. So just out of sheer survival, it was just sort of like a, a um, work and try to do the best work and try to learn, you know, try to learn the rooms and understand the language coming here from New York City too. It's an entirely different culture and language in Nashville than it was in New York City. Because uh, I was doing, I was writing, I've always been, I was like in bands and whatever growing up, but yeah, I would say out of sheer survival, it, it it's, I don't know if that's a piece of advice, but just there, the time it takes to uh, dwell on something that would be holding you back um, is probably just time not well spent. Just I keep like that. Yeah, I'll second that. I'll piggyback off of that and just say. <laughs> <laughs> we can circle back about it later too. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, well, ladies, thank you so very much for being a part of Wise Women Wednesday. You're both very wise. Oh, oh. Well, we're yeah. at least both women. That's for sure. So. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also Wednesday. So that is true. <laughs> so I hear they say two out of three ain't bad. Um, well, we have another great panel coming up next Wednesday. So if anyone is interested, please sign up. We would love to have you. We have lots of wise women coming your way. And yeah, thank you all for coming. This was so fun. I really enjoyed talking to both of you. Thank you for sharing. We Thanks love you. for having us, Lydia. Yeah, yeah, we love you. We don't know what we do without you. I know, you're so great. It's oh, really so sweet. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye.